Vaigurji Ka Khalsa, Vaigurji Ki Fateh. Welcome to another Sikh Spectrum. I've come to Oxford today to interview uh, Priya Kaur Atwal, who's doing a PhD um, here at Oxford. And we'll ask her um, about her studies. But first, let's do Fateh together. Vaigurji Ka Khalsa, Vaigurji Ki Fateh. So Priya, let's uh, talk about you um, studying here in Oxford. Um, but before we do that, why don't you give us a short profile about yourself? Okay, so obviously my name is Priya. Um, I'm 24 years old um, and I'm studying history at Oxford. I grew up in High Wycombe, born and brought up in High Wycombe. Um, my dad's from India and my mum's uh, also brought up in High Wycombe, um, but from a Sikh Punjabi background. And I went to school, um, I went to a grammar school, Wickham High School, um, from about the age of 11 to 18. And it was there that I kind of figured out that I wanted to study history. I've never quite known what I want to do, uh, but history was always a subject that I really loved. And um, my mum and dad really encouraged me. They, they used to take us on lots of uh, day trips to see country houses and my dad always blames my interest on history, on my reading the horrible history magazines when I was little. He says, if I bought you horrible medicine, maybe you would have been a doctor. <laughs> but um, I, always, I always loved it. And so when it came to doing the UCAS applications, um, I knew I wanted to do history. My teachers were very encouraging of me. And they, um, from about year 10, so when I was doing GCSEs, even before UCAS, they put me on an open day, sent me on an open day to Oxford. And I mean, at that time, I was about 15, 16, I was like, Oh, I don't want to go there. That's a bit, bit too, you know, out of my league. Um, but my mum was like, you know, do John Lee again? This is a really good opportunity for you. Um, so I went along, and I think that was my first glimpse of it. And you know, it was a beautiful sunny day. The buildings are absolutely gorgeous, and kind of planted the seed in my mind that this is somewhere I'd love to come and study. And then, yeah, when it came round to getting my AS levels, I got, you know, the, a good enough grades to give it a go. So I thought, you know, okay, I'll, I'll apply, see what happens. Didn't ever expect to get in. Um, and then, yeah, I did my undergraduate degree in Oxford at Oriel College. And then uh, that was three years of a history BA. Um, decided to stick on for a master's in global and imperial history, again at the same college. And um, then I took a year out and did some work because I wanted to earn some money after uh, my parents had paid for my master's. But it was during that year that I thought I kind of rem rem really missed Oxford. I was working in London, but I, I missed the academic life and I missed being at Oxford. So I decided to apply to do a PhD. And here I am, and I'm in my middle of my second year now doing a, a, hist a, a PhD on the relationship between Queen Victoria and the Sikh royal family in particular. Um, but looking at ideas of the evolution of monarchy under the British Raj and uh, gender politics and um, how cultural imperialism had a role to play in the way that Indian and British monarchs kind of related to each other. So it's become a really fascinating project to work on and it's, it's an amazing opportunity to be here. Okay, so before I ask you questions about your PhD, <clears throat> let me ask you about um, when you first applied. I mean, you know, most, um, <laughs> most kids that want to apply for university, they won't yeah. really consider Oxford thinking it's quite daunting. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. you know, what sort of advice would you give children that are thinking, you know, even if you've got the top grades, yeah. about going to Oxford or Cambridge? Um, well, the thing is, I, I was terrified myself, and my teachers were really encouraging, my parents were really encouraging, and I, to be honest, I think from a young age, the only name of a university I knew was Oxford University. It's it, quite in our culture to know, I mean, even in Bollywood films, the name comes up, doesn't it? They always say, oh, Oxford University. <coughs> um, so... And I knew it was a really good university, and, but yeah, there's this very daunting aspect to it. And what I would say is, is, if you've got those grades and you're considering applying to places like UCL or Imperial or Durham or Bristol, then give Oxford and Cambridge a go as well. Well, maybe not Cambridge, but you know, uh, obviously as an Oxford student, I'm yes. going to say that. But give those two universities a go. You can only obviously apply to one of them. Um, they have got, you know, the, the, admission, the admissions department are doing amazing work to kind of get people to know more about the university, what's involved in applying. And I would say reach out to go to, those, you know, to that department, go to visit Oxford, go and have a look for yourself. You know, go for an open day, have a chance to speak to the tutors and come and speak to us. Um, we run the Oxford Sikh Society here. I'm, I'm involved with that. And we have this buddy scheme where we um, welcome questions from, from students that want to apply um, from any background, Sikh or non-Sikh, any subject. Um, because we know it's daunting. I know it's daunting. Um, you know, you, you, you do your UCAS, you have to write an essay, 
you have to come for a three day long interview session. And for me, that was the scariest part because I hadn't been away from home before that much. So I was like, you know, it, it is, it's intense. But if you've got supportive background at home and you've got teachers that are willing you to go for it, it's one space on your UCAS form. Why not give it a go? You just don't know. You know, if you just go for it wholeheartedly, you might be able to do it. And you, you, the benefit of the fantastic education that you get is well worth the effort. But most universities would not do three days like they do here in Oxford. No, but the reason why they do three days uh, interviews in Oxford is that they get to know you as a candidate. And that's one thing that is way, um, it's such a huge you know, benefit to an applicant. What they do is the interview, the way it's set up, is it's meant to be like an Oxford tutorial. So it's, it's only 20 minutes, but you sit with those expert tutors. You, they might give you something to read, like an, a chapter in an article, or they'll, they'll go through your essay with you. And it is a model of what the Oxford teaching style is like. So you really actually get to experience that. Right. So it's a great opportunity, you know, and you get to meet some fantastic academics just on coming for an interview. Um, you get to live in the college for three days. You get all f you know, free accommodation and a room and, and food and everything as well. So you, you get to really sample that Oxford life. So I would say to people, don't necessarily... I think if I was talking back to my 18-year-old self, who was really terrified on the day that I had to get to the interview, I would say take it as an opportunity to just soak up the atmosphere and see if it's right for you. You, you mentioned the, um, the buddy scheme. <coughs> yeah. Just, just elaborate on that. What, when did that start and why did you form it? So that's only started over the past year, uh, something that we've launched. Um, we've started, the Sikh Society have started running open days, um, where we're basically we get some academics or graduate students from, who are doing research in all kinds of Sikh uh, topics um, to give open, like an open discussion of their research. So we've, we've, we launched that about in 2012. And off the back of that, we had um, families coming to visit Oxford, use it as a day to come and check it out, and also meet the current students. And what we thought was is we, we've always done it informally, whereby you know, current students will, if somebody's applying, we know of a friend of a family or someone who's applying, we'll, we will help them out. We'll match them up with a, the applicant, with a student who's currently studying here on their same course. And then that student can then help them out with any questions that they have about what life is like at Oxford or... Um, you know, what the course is like, or uh, a little bit on how to phrase your personal statement, but obviously the admissions department can give better advice on that sort of thing. But the buddy scheme now is we've actually got a pool of current students and alumni who've gone through the Oxford system from a range of different subjects, a range of different backgrounds, and they have volunteered to be there for any kids that are thinking of applying, whether they're Sikh or non-Sikh. If people just get in touch with us at our email address, which is oxford.seekSoc at gmail.com, we can then match you with a student who's from, you know, doing your same course at the moment, and they can answer any questions you okay, have. But what age group? Well, it depends. At? So we're, we're help, willing to help anyone from the age of about 16 to 18 who's applying for undergraduate level. Anybody who's got a place, uh, so who is like, you know, preparing to come to Oxford, so, right. you know, as an undergraduate. And even graduate students, if they're interested in applying and they want to speak to a current graduate student. Um, so, for example, we've got one young lady who's coming from Kashmir, uh, starting in October, she's going to be coming to do an MBA. So, you know, it's a friendly, friendly yeah, yeah. face when you get here. So it's not only for Sikhs, you said? No. But the thing is, is, you know, if you think about how we do Seva in our community, we don't just help Sikhs, do we? We help everybody. So that's what we're trying to say, that there are lots of underprivileged communities that would want to study at Oxford but haven't got the opportunity. I mean, we, we are, Sikhs are a minority in Oxford, but it doesn't mean that we're going to just help our own people. We want to help everybody. Okay, talking about Sikhs in Oxford then, in the university, yeah. so you've, you've got a, uh, a Sikh society yeah. and you're the what, vice president. Vice president, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, how, how many um, students belong in that particular group and what type of functions do you hold? <clears throat> um, well, the numbers vary depending on students that are around, um, the number of people who can make it to our events on a Wednesday. Um, so, I mean, I think at our peak we'll probably have about 30 to 40 students that will come on a regular basis. At the moment it's more like 10 to 15 probably. Um, but in the community, there's a few Sikh families. There's a local Godwara. Um, it's really, it's really small, but it's a really friendly, really, really friendly community. Um, and on a general basis, every term we have really sh short terms, only eight weeks long. So really busy. Um, but we have, we do all sorts of stuff. We have the, our main thing is a weekly discussion, uh, followed by normally a dinner somewhere, um, which is very sociable. Um, 
we will do discussions on all different topics and it's run by students for students so everyone chips in their ideas everyone's able to get involved and um, you know we have a laugh and we also learn from each other um, but we do other things as well we do Gitan um, once a term especially it's really important around exam time calms everyone down you know when you're <laughs> revising and you're getting a headache it's really useful um, and we've had some really good singers in the past within the, with the student community, so they've been amazing. We do um, speaker events. We invite all kinds of different speakers in. We've had people from the BBC and um, from different research backgrounds and, and doctors and lawyers and, you know, all sorts of different people coming to give talks. And we also do social events, um, which can be with, with Sikh students or it can be interfaith. And lastly, we do bits of Siva. With, there's a, there's a, quite a problem with homelessness in the local Oxford community so definitely in the winter uh, the first term of the year everyone does a collection of money and of donatable items and we make food and we go out and we give it to the homeless okay, so no, we try and great. do a lot of different stuff of all the of all the universities I've always thought that Oxford there wasn't a lot happening with Sikhs that's why I <laughs> asked you that question um, let's, let's go back to talking about your degree your first degree your bachelor's okay. that you did yeah what, uh, what 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 was that in that was in history but yep. which particular history? Oh, well, you have to do a bit of everything as an undergraduate. Right. So uh, you have to do uh, three different periods of history, uh, which is uh, medieval, early modern, and modern. And you say modern, but modern starts at like, I don't know, 1688 to the modern present day. So, um, but I've, I've preferred the modern stuff. And uh, I did, you have to also do a broad spread of like global history. So my favourite subjects were American history of, of the Civil War and slavery and also Indian history. And it was Indian history that I then decided to specialise in, or the history of the British Empire. So my undergraduate thesis, you have to do a dissertation in your third year, which is like testing your skills as an independent historian. And I decided to write about Maharani Jindgore and her involvement in the Anglo-Sikh Wars. And that, that little bit was what got me inspired to do my PhD thesis, what I'm doing it on now. Yeah. So you're um, Maharani Jindakur, have you done some research on her? I have, in, yeah. In, well, when she lived, obviously, she came to the UK as well. Didn't yeah, she? yeah. Um, so that was, that was a funny thing, that how my interest got sparked in that. I, it was my first year. I'd never heard about any of this stuff before. And I guess it's kind of embarrassing to admit as a Sikh and as a history student to not even... I didn't even know that there was a Sikh empire. That's just how clueless I was when I went to university. But, you know, you're growing up in an English area, You'll know much more about Queen Elizabeth I and Henry VIII than you will know about your own history, potentially, right? So when I got to university, I think this is a funny thing that people say. You don't expect to, at a place like Oxford to get to learn about all this stuff. But it was through the Sikh Society in my first, one of my first terms, there was, they held a speaker event and it was about the Sikh Empire and, and Maharani Jindgore as a character really stuck out to me. <clears throat> and it was then I did some research, volunteer work as a, re a researcher for the anglo Sikh Heritage Trail, and that was when I first started to learn about the Rani. And then I turned that into my um, undergraduate thesis, and I did some research at the British Library and in Oxford um, about her role in the anglo Sikh Wars and all the controversies that surrounded that. Right. Is, is there anything that you found out about her that most people don't know that you want to share? There's probably quite a lot. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think... The biggest thing is the nature of her involvement in the wars. Um, and I, I don't know if I should say this, I should probably publish it first. But um, yeah, I, the, some of the documents I've looked at in the British Library, I mean, she's been accused of uh, starting that war uh, because she supposedly wanted to avenge her brother uh, for, you know, for his murder by the Khalsa troops. And she certainly was very angry about it. But from the documents that I've seen, there was a lot more behind the scenes dealing going on between the British and a certain Raja Galav Singh. And I think from what I've read that the Maharani was actually manoeuvred into a position whereby she wasn't actually in control of events. So then this narrative of her avenging her brother is actually more of a cover story, I would say. But um, it's something that I'm digging into a lot more okay. at the moment. So I don't want to no, you know, no, that's fine. Give, I mean, it, give it away when I haven't got the whole story. <laughs> no, that's fine. The, the reason I asked you that question is because um, a lot of people haven't gone into history the way that you're actually now, you know, scrutinising it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think it's great because um, um, there, there's only one other gentleman that I know that's done some work on, uh, you know, Maharaja Dalip Singh, mm. um, and that's more photography. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, no, no, I think that's really good. So what, what will your PhD focus on? 
So my, my PhD, I mean, it naturally has to be very academic. Um, I, can't, I, I would love to just write a biography of the Sikh royal family, but I, I can't. Um, so what I'm looking at is the relationship between um, the British royal family in the 19th century and Indian royalty, but I'm looking specifically at the case study of the, the Sikh royal family in the Punjab, because just simply for the fact that Queen Victoria was so very close to Maharaja Dilip Singh. Um, so I'm looking at the way in which um, the kind of Indian royalty is being displaced at this time, particularly Indian queens, and I'm looking at them in comparison with changes in the way that the British royal family is perceived as well, the British monarchy, because at this time you see that the British crown is not, you know, an absolute monarchy. It's not a despotism. It is becoming a constitutional monarchy. So the crown is meant to be kind of seen but not heard. It's not supposed to involve itself in politics. But this is a time when the British Raj is growing and royalty becomes to play an, a symbolic role. Um, but it's an interesting position because, you know, the British crown is, the power is also waning. And what I'm looking at is how potentially a new role might have been found for both Indian and British royalties through these new relationships that they were forging with each other and very private personal relationships. And, you know, they're kind of things that aren't sort of studied that much, you know, what these, what, what did Queen Victoria say to Maharaja Dalip Singh when he came to visit her in, in Buckingham Palace, you know, what kind of conversations did they have? What did the Governor General sitting in India think about this? He wasn't very happy about it, for definite. He was not happy about Dilip Singh having tea with all the princesses. He, he thought he was stepping out of line by doing that. So there's politics involved in all this sort of stuff. And then, you know, there's, it's all photographed at that time. Photography is a new thing. Um, it starts coming in newspapers that they're best of pals and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And I'm, I'm looking at the politics behind this. It's, it's culture imperialism. That's my topic. And the more I'm looking at it, the more new angles I'm finding. So, so I'm trying to you, rein it will in. Will you capture <laughs> some of the stuff that um, the public haven't seen? don't know about? I think so, yes. So, I mean, some of the, there's, there's material in Oxford that I don't think anyone's looked at, um, which are the letters about the Leap Singh and the Secretary of State for India, Lord Kimberley, at that time, 1886, when he rebels, when he's just about to rebel and go and try and go back to the Punjab. And I don't think anyone's really looked at those letters that closely. I'm also going to be going to Windsor Castle. I've got permission to go and do some research in the Royal Archives on Queen Victoria's letters and all this sort of stuff. And I know a few people have looked at that, but I mean, I don't know if it's going to be completely new material, but I'm looking at it in a new way. So it's massively exciting. I'm really, you know, feel so privileged to be able to do it. And I'm a history geek at the end of the day, so I love it. I can't wait to go and do a bit of poking around. But the, the, the private sort of meetings with Dalip Singh and Queen Victoria, yeah. sh surely she didn't write all the... Um, that, how she felt about it. Oh yeah, it. she had she a did. diary, yeah, she, it's online, Any, uh, pr most people can see it if they're interested. She wrote a diary every night, her, her journals, and she wrote, I mean, the, the one, the first meeting that they had, she was raving about him, she was like, such a beautiful boy, you know, so good looking, and so well mannered, and you know, she, just, because she'd obviously heard about him, Ranjit Singh used to send presents to her, you know, Supposedly, even some Tibetan sheep were, were sent from his reaches of his empire in Tibet to Queen Victoria as a gift. So she knew all about Ranjit Singh. She knew all about the Sikh empire. There were allies against the Afghans um, in the 1830s. So when she then meets the Leap Singh, it's with a great amount of excitement. And she does. She writes about it in her journal. She has some fascinating conversations with him. And I'm just very lucky that there are these records there that you can recreate this history. Do you, do you, are you aware of a new film coming out? Yes, I can't are. wait. I really want to see it. Um, I, I haven't been able to ca get hold of the, the people that are making it, but I would love to interview them and see how they're going to tell the story. But is that based on factual evidence or is that... Um, I, I don't know how it's being made, right. unfortunately. But like I said, I, that's why I want to see how they're making it. Because for me, I'm looking at the representations of these relationships and that films being made on this is, is great, I think. It's fantastic. Okay. So what, um, I mean, after you've done your PhD, yeah. what are you hoping to do after that? Oh, that's a big question. That's the I'm sure your parents <laughs> always, are, uh, you know, waiting yeah, to hear ev Yeah, every day. Uh, <laughs> um, it's kind of between two fields at the moment. I'm looking either at working in TV and, and research of documentaries and that sort of stuff, because I really like doing that sort of thing. I've done a few internships with the BBC and stuff in the past, and it's amazing to get your research out there to a wider audience. Um, or, you know, in general, other topics. But the other side of things that I'm interested in as well is working in education. So either as a teacher in secondary school or as a lecturer at university, um, 
maybe combining those two sides, TV and education, I don't know. But I'm, I'm kind of scoping out those two areas at the moment because I definitely want to do something with my degree um, and my research knowledge, I think. It's just working out which is the best route at the moment. So, yeah. What's your link with, um, with Sikhs generally? I mean, High Wycombe isn't uh, very highly populated with Sikhs, is no. it? No, this is the thing. I've never been quite in an area where there's a lot of Sikh people, I guess. I don't know what this is, Gismet, really. But um, I, I tr that's why I try to get involved with the Sikh Society, and that's why we have pushed to do our events like the Open Days and make Oxford, our Sikh community in Oxford, more accessible to the public. That's something that really does mean something to me. Um, and, you know, as I said at the beginning, I, I would love for more people to benefit from the style of education that I've had. And that's why I don't want people to think that Oxford is such a daunting place, you know, because if I can get here, <laughs> then anyone can get here. Um, and that's, again, why I'd like to work potentially in the, in the media field, because these are stories, you know. Yes, fine, it's a Sikh story. It's a Sikh Maharaja, Sikh Maharani. But they have a meaning that can relate to lots of different people. There's a history that connects a lot of, a lot of different cultures. And that's how I would like to make the contribution to my community, hopefully, as well. Okay, what about um, um, other activities away from academics? Okay. Um, what do you do socially or interest or hobbies oh, that you might have? It's hard to find the time to do lots of other stuff at the minute. I mean, um, I'm full-time working on my research. I, 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 like I said, I work with the Sikh Society. Um, I've got a part-time job as well because I haven't got funding for my PhD. It's very, very difficult to get funding at the moment. Um, so I've been working on all sorts of different projects. Um, I've, I've been working in outreach to the university. I've been I've worked on a documentary last year, which is hopefully going to go to the BBC um, on the Indian contribution to World War One. Um, when I'm not doing all of that, I just like to spend time with my my friends and my family, just chill and watch films and you know just read something that isn't historical and go sightseeing to places and occasionally watch the football with my brother down at the local football ground, Wickham Wanderers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to find the time at the moment. <laughs> you touched on Oxford's time in studying here is eight weeks. Eight weeks, yeah. That must be pretty intense for any student coming compared Very to other intense. universities. Yeah, uh, it's, well, eight weeks a terms, um, and that's the same for all three. It's not like the exam time one is shorter. It is very intense, but you get long holidays in between. Uh, the summer is amazing, three months off. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a real work hard, play hard atmosphere. And I mean, on the weekends, it's very quiet in Oxford, but on the weekdays, it's, just, it's buzzing, you know? And, and most students will not only do their studies, but they'll be involved in a million and one extracurricular activities, which I was the same. Um, I mean, in my master's year, I wrote and directed a Bollywood play. Right. And that was just so much fun. You know, we did a bit of Bhangra dancing in there and everything. Um, so there's, there's a really vibrant culture here. And it kind of, I think that takes, a, you have an out, a release for your, your stress of your studies. You have, you know, you can get involved in a lot of stuff in sports and all that sort of thing. So it is, it's a short burst of intense study for eight weeks. But then you have six week long holidays in the middle where you can kind of have a breather and consolidate what you've been doing and catch up on sleep and, and food and that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've, we've really come to the end of our interview, but I do want to ask you about other students. Yeah. Are, are there, do you think Sikhs should be doing more studies on, on themselves? Like, you, you've obviously picked this particular topic about Maharaj Ranjit Singh's time, mm -hmm. but do you think that um, we don't have enough Sikh historians as such? Um, I think, to be honest with you, I, d I don't know what it is. I, d I don't think we have, we don't have many people, you're right. Um, I don't know if it needs to be necessarily Sikh students. I mean, I've, I've seen some fantastic um, people of other backgrounds that are doing amazing research. And, you know, hats off to them. Because, I mean, my, I had a, my friend here taught me to read Punjabi. And he's a Gora from Canada, OK? He's a ma an amazing guy. And I just think, but I, I think, yes, I think there does need to be something within our community. We, I don't think we have enough respect for our history to then go and dedicate ourselves to do the research. And I think it would be great to see, I mean, I know we have interest, we definitely have interest, and that's amazing, you know? We have really good turnouts at all our events, there's been some fantastic exhibitions in London, <clears throat> but it'd be good to see more, more students coming out. But I think, you know what the problem is? We haven't got the funding support for this sort of thing. I personally am having to pay my way through, my parents are supporting me, I've got a part-time job, but it's very expensive to do this now.
So it would be good if, if we could have a bit more support on that side from the community, and I think naturally we'd see more students coming forward. All right. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's fascinating. It's obviously, I can see the passion that you have for, you. for history. I think <laughs> it's great, and I can only wish you the best. Thank you very um, much. We've come to the end of our, our interview, and I, I want to thank you, Priya, for allowing us to come to Oxford anyway. Um, oh, you're very welcome. Because it's not easy, I know. <laughs> and um, I, I will take some of your um, issues that you brought up on board, especially about funding. Yeah. And we, we hope to, um, you know, read your PhD when oh, it's yeah. done. So Hopefully, yeah. Uh, one day. <laughs> that's great. Thank you very much. Let's Thank do you. further together. Cheers. Bye, 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 Bye